Welcome to An Apple a Day, a podcast, a resource, a community. Share your experiences and learn from others as we overcome barriers and learn to live a happy, healthy life with a disability. Welcome to the community. Here's your host, Jimmy Apple. Welcome to another episode of An Apple a Day. I'm your host, Jimmy Apple. I want to remind you, An Apple a Day is brought to you by www. FamousApple.com. FamousApple.com is the home site for this podcast. So if you get a minute, check it out. And while you're tripping around the web, make sure you stop by FamousApple.com forward slash group. That's off group page on Facebook, an Apple a Day page. It's Living with a Disability. So if you get a minute, go over there, check that out. A lot of people over there chatting and talking. Maybe you can answer some questions for some people. Maybe they can answer some of your questions. Or if not, you might make a new friend or two. People over there from around the world. So again, that's famousapple.com forward slash group. So how you feeling today, my friend? You feeling good? You feeling strong? You feeling better than you did yesterday? Excellent. You can't ask for better than that. We have got a good one for you today. It's an interview with Matthew Clickstein. He's the author of The Kids from Whitney Junior High Take Over the World. This book has got to be one of the funniest books I've ever read. It's meant for, you know, young adults. But people of all ages will enjoy this book. Believe me when I tell you that. I read it and I laughed. It's a warm-hearted, funny book. And i tell you what, it's got rave ratings. Jackson Brown, the singer, he was, he was raving about it. He loved the book. Maya Balik. Now, you might know her from Blossom or you might know her as... Sheldon's girlfriend slash wife on the Big Bang Theory, Amy Farrah She She was raving about this book. Uh, very nice lady, by the way. But you got to take a chance on it. You got to take a, take a look at this book. And you can do that. You can look at it or you can buy it at famousapple.com forward slash WJH. That's Famous Apple dot com forward slash w j h now i'm not going to do a whole lot of talking here i want to get right to it but there's one question there's one question i'm going to put out there for you guys has nothing to do with the book at the moment has nothing to do with disability or anything like that i just have a question has anyone else noticed this you're out you're driving it's nighttime and people have a habit of driving with their fog lights on. Now, I don't know about anybody else, but they have it on whether there's fog or not. That is the most annoying thing in the world to me. It's worse than driving into someone with their bright lights on when there's no need for it. But just something to think about. Me, from now on, when I see someone with their fog lights on, I'm putting my bright lights on. Just a thought. Anyhow, sit back, relax, and I'm going to introduce you to Matthew Clickstein. And we're here with Matthew Clickstein. That's Matthew with one T. (laughs) Uh, And he's the author of a new book, The Kids of Whitney Junior High Take Over the World. Hello, Matthew. How are you today? Doing very well. Thanks for having me on the show. This book, <laughs> I I read this book, I think I read it in three days. <laughs> it's a funny book. It's actually a funny book and kind of reminds me of when I was a kid. But there's more to it than that. And I have to say, I read the, I read the reviews on it. This is the number one seller, number one bestseller on Amazon on children's books with disability. This book was reviewed by Mayim Balik. Now, everyone knows Mayim Balik. And if you're sitting there scratching your head, think of Blossom. And think of the Big Bang Theory. Think of Amy Farrah Fowler, Sheldon's girlfriend, or Sheldon's wife at the end. She said this book is tender, it's funny, it's perfect to read, and 
with your kids and it gives me hope love these kids let me tell you i agree with, i agree with amy or my Mayim, however you want to say it <laughs> uh so go ahead matthew tell us a little bit about yourself first before we get into the book uh certainly um again appreciate being on the show here i appreciate you being uh, here <laughs> and thanks, by the way, for making it clear that my name is spelled with one T. One T. Surprised, or maybe not, how often that uh, people misspell it. And it does actually cause some some issues. In fact, I did not know, you know, talking about something about myself, I did not realize that it was legally spelled with one T. This is not just an affectation uh, or some diva flourish. Uh, my name uh, apparently was misspelled on my birth certificate. I was born in my house uh, intentionally. My mom has a real fear of doctors. Uh, so she had a midwife come and it was all set up. But apparently the midwife misspelled my name on my birth certificate. And uh, the way that I learned that was, uh, I guess no one had ever bothered to look at it or whatever it might be. But when I was getting my driver's license when I turned 16, it caused all sort of kerfuffles in the system. And then until someone realized and saw that indeed my name was spelled with one T um, <laughs> that in collusion with the fact that I actually have always really despised my name. I always felt it was a little too common. And uh, you know, there was always at least one other Matt in my class. We usually would end up being best friends. So it was always Matt K and Matt G or Matt K and Matt M or whatever it would be. I even had a band with a friend who his name was Matt. We were two Matt's too many. Uh, <laughs> we never actually played any music, but we like to uh, claim that we were a band. Anyway, um, so I, I always disliked my name. And it was around when I was 16 that I really was taking writing more seriously. And I realized, hey, you know, if I really stick with this uh, one T name, at least my name is will be a little bit more unique. Um, on top of all of that, uh, there actually is another Matthew Clickstein in this world of ours in the country. Uh, he's a musician in Brooklyn. He's a bit older than I. Uh, we've never met. We've never communicated. But there is another Matthew Clickstein. And his name is spelled uh, the traditional way with two T's. So this way I have a name that's slightly more unique, Matthew, and that's not going to be confused with the other Matthew Clickstein out there. Um, and, um, you know, I also it is a little fun to confuse people, but I it is spelled with one T and it is Clickstein, not Clickstein. Uh, and there are a lot of times too that people try to slip in an E N into Clickstein, uh, I guess, cause it's similar to Frankenstein. So I get Clickenstein or Clickenstein a lot, <laughs> uh, which has uh, really been the bane of my existence ever since I was younger when it comes to people mispronouncing my name. But I guess that's one, uh, one, uh, little anecdote about my life, uh, to keep it short, uh, too late. Um, I am originally from Southern California. I've been writing my entire life. I've always loved it and enjoyed it. I feel very grateful that it's something that I've been able to do for a living uh, for pretty much the last 20 years now. It's pretty much all I've ever done is write and produce and teach um, writing and, and film work. Um, and uh, for uh, around the same amount of time, uh, li literally since my freshman year of college, I have worked very closely with a group called the Kids of Whitney High. I, uh, they're based out of a special ed high school in Los Angeles called Whitney High School, of course. Uh, and there was a music program there run by a guy named Michael Monaghan, who I became very close with uh, right when I first started at film school at USC, which happened to be down the street from Whitney High. Uh, I'd been introduced to the music, uh, coincidentally, twice in one of the first weeks of school by two very different people who knew I was into outsider art and knew that I was very intrigued by different kinds of music, uh, a very eclectic music. And they both played me some Kids of Whitney High. I could not find an album of theirs. And this was sort of the, the early days of the internet. Uh, so it's still very difficult even to try to order something online. So I emailed the website for the Kids of Whitney High. And yeah, Michael Monaghan emailed me right back. He's, he was their teacher of their music program and said, oh, you're at USC because he saw my email address and said, you know, we're about 10 minutes from you. Why don't you swing on by someday? I did, and we became fast friends. And pretty much the entire time I was at film school in USC, I was weirdly obsessed with the band. I went to many, 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 many shows of theirs. I kind of helped get them gigs. I helped them get to and from the show since none of them drive. Um, and, uh, you know, I started making little videos about them. I wrote essays about them for different classes. Anybody went to film school with me uh, or was with me even in, in my non-film school classes, my general ed classes, and, and they would all know me as the Kids of Whitney High guy because I just was really, really into the band, the music, their message, and the people themselves. I mean, the members of the band themselves I became very close with and remain very close with. 
Uh, and over the years, I, I made various projects with them, even after I got out of school. Uh, and about t- almost 10 years ago, I had the idea of trying to do a kind of children's book about them or based on them with some of their consultation. And yeah, it was, it was I think, eight or nine years ago that I wrote the proposal for the kids of Whitney Junior High. I uh, tried uh, as hard as I could to get it out there. And uh, I was not able to find a publisher until about two years ago when uh, Shipper Kids, uh, S-C-H-I-F-F-E-R, uh, got in on it. And uh, they've been great. They put the book out in September. Uh, and we actually also have recently sold the audiobook edition to Blackstone Audio. And that'll be coming out March 9th. So that's, Excellent. Yeah, I don't know what, yeah. So I don't Excellent. know when this is this episode's going to air, but it might be around the same time. And I will say for anyone who's a fan of the Kids of Whitney High, or are curious about them, uh, what's great about the audiobook edition, uh, even if you have the print book, uh, there will actually be a few bonus uh, materials, including uh, two unreleased Kids of Winnie High songs that I don't think anybody's heard except for the band and their family and friends. So that's something that we're really excited about. Um, and uh, yeah, that uh, like I said, that comes out March 9th through Blackstone Audio. Now with, with the hardcover book that's out now, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There's also... Isn't there three downloads on this? Yeah, what's really uh, what's really good. I, you know, I have a tendency when I work on projects, I, I really like to jam pack it with as much stuff as possible, um, and uh, I always find innovative ways to make each project that I work on uh, just dense with content. I, I have a lot of fun with that, and I have a lot of ideas. And in this case, one of them was, and I honestly, when I first brought it to the publisher when we first started working on this about two years ago, um, the hardcover edition, uh, I suggested, what if we had some kind of a barcode or something on the back cover that people could scan with their phones or devices and download free Kids of Whitney High songs? And again, I, I really had no idea if that was even possible, how that would work. I assumed that that was something that could work. I feel like I had heard of something like that before, seen something like that before, just wanted to see if they could do it. And they said that they could, and indeed we did. So when you buy the hardcover book, it does have a, um, it does have a, a barcode on the back that you can scan. And I believe there's a way of doing it with the Kindle uh, or ebook edition as well that exists. Uh, I would imagine that they have that there as well. So you can indeed uh, get a few free songs, but, you know, what's nice about the audiobook again coming out is it's two unreleased songs that are not on any of the kids' albums. They actually have four albums out, uh, including a live album that was their last album that came out, I think, about 10 years ago. The band's been kind of defunct over the last few years. Um, the kids of Whitney High have all grown up. Uh, Michael Monaghan actually retired from Whitney High School, unfortunately, due to budget uh, constraints and some other issues. The program has not been continued. So they're, they're, in some ways, there's no, there's definitely no music program at Whitney, which is really a shame. Um, but the kids at Whitney High are kind of not really active or haven't been for the last few years, aside from that's, this book and a few terrible. other projects. Yeah, I mean, we, you know, truth be told, one because, again, we had been, I'd been working with Schiffer, the publisher, on this book for the last two years. Uh, we had all these really large plans of doing a big launch event in L.A. Um, at this huge event, music venue. We were going to show the Kids of Whitney High documentary that we made a few years ago, Act Your Age. Uh, we were going to have the, the band play. We were going to bill it as a reunion show. We were going to do a book signing. We were partnering with Skylight Books, the largest independent bookseller in L.A., we were going to maybe have some celebrity guests come do q and A. It was going to be this full big event at one of the, the big music and uh, movie venues uh, right there in, in downtown L.A. Uh, and we were really getting ready for it. And then I'm sure I don't have to explain why that ended up not happening. <laughs> but we had been planning for it for over a year. And uh, uh, we were hoping that if that had happened, that would have been an opportunity especially if we had gotten some great local press in LA and LA magazine and LA weekly and LA times and all that, that, you know, we'd, we'd ring some bells and maybe get some producers to come out to either keep doing some music with the kids or maybe even do a TV series or a movie or, you know, we, they're very talented people and uh, some of them write and some of them act and uh, some of them do photography and podcasting. Uh, They're all artists in addition to being musicians and songwriters um, and so we really wanted to come out with, you know, yeah, like a TV series, maybe, or a cartoon series or 
something. But unfortunately, we've had to kind of uh, button that up for now while we're waiting on lockdown stuff to to, uh, to uh, diminish. But, you know, we'll see. But yeah, for the time being, uh, kids are kind of defunct for the moment, aside from this book and a few other uh, little projects that we do here or there just for fun. Do you keep in touch with, with, with them at, at all or...? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. No, they they really are close friends of mine. Um, we, we talk pretty regularly. Uh, they're friends with a lot of my friends as well. Um, I left L.A. in 2009, uh, where the kids are based out of, except for one who lives in Arizona. Um, but yeah, I speak with most of them pretty regularly. Uh, I, I have a, I'm not on social media aside from LinkedIn, which I use mainly just for business stuff. Uh, so a lot of my friends joke that I'm kind of like a, a like a human Facebook. I have a tend <laughs> I'm one of those people who stays in touch with everybody. And I've moved around a lot all over the country. And I tend to work for local newspapers and get really involved in the community with different organizations. So I, you know, I'm, I'm the kind of person who I've lived in all these different places, and I'm not just you know hanging out at my house watching TV. I'm out there and getting to know people and networking. It's one of the things I've really enjoyed about traveling, especially being a writer and working for the local newspapers. I get really close with a lot of different people. People in these different communities and yeah i i like to stay in touch with folks so i i call a lot of my friends and colleagues you know every few weeks just to check especially lately you know with lockdown and covid make sure, sure everyone's okay and um you know a lot of people even outside of the kids of whitney high i continue to do to work with um you know i'm working on a project right now with a friend of mine in la another one in chicago a couple people in new york a couple people in the boulder area i'm right now in dayton ohio where my my, my wife and i moved about a year ago and so, you know, keeping in touch with the kids is pretty natural for me because I keep in touch with all of my friends and like to continue working with them, especially with the book having come out. You know, I've, I've, we've even done a few things for the book, um, little videos that we've done over Zoom and uh, things like that where the kids have gotten involved in it. The kids of Whitney High members have gotten involved in it. And, uh, you know, we, we want to keep trying to do stuff like that. So, um Absolutely. Yeah. And they've, well, they've, they're really excited about the book and we're great with consulting on it. And there's actually, as you saw, an interview with one of the kids of Whitney High members who I'm particularly close with, Pee Wee, uh, about the importance yeah. of representation <laughs> and, and why a book like this is, is significant. And we're hoping if this, if this were to become a series, even within the books, that each book would have a, an interview with a different kids of Whitney High member at the end talking about an important issue of his or her choice. Well, to be uh, honest, so, you know, with this book, coming away from this book, you, you, you almost feel like you know these kids. Yeah, it at seems the, to at, be a lot at, of people are saying that. At the end of the book, I almost feel like I know these kids, and I'm significantly older than they are. But coming yeah. coming away from the book, I feel like I, I, at the end of the book, I feel like, wow, I, I, I just lost contact with friends of mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah no i i mean i i we really the plan was for this to become a a, a a series of books and i already have the next few installments uh lined up and I, uh, the the goal because it's a kind of fictional version of the band mm -hmm. um and they're you know it's the junior high school version of the kids of whitney high so there'll be you know perpetually 11 or 12 um kind of like the you know muppet babies to the muppets or things like that um, I wanted to, and there's a lot of sense of nostalgia and kind of playfulness of the 80s. Exactly. And 90s, the 80s and 90s. So I wanted to actually revisit certain sitcom tropes and that kind of thing with the story. So I had an, I had an idea of having them accidentally go to college and then having, you know, even though they're really young in the book or, or having them go back in time or having them go to the moon. And, you know, I want to kind of play with these very conventional tropes but do it kids of Whitney high style. And that was, that was kind of what our goal uh, is to, if we get to do some more of these in the future, there's been some discussion um, about possibly adapting into a cartoon series. And I think that would give us an opportunity to really get creative with it. And like I said, yeah, you know, just some wild adventures of going back in time or going to the moon or going to Mars or, you know, really, really going for it. I mean, it needn't just be their day-to-day -day lives, which are certainly very interesting and will so, would still help inform these stories, whether it becomes a cartoon or a movie or a TV series or further books, if we do get to do more material, more ancillary products mm -hmm. like that. Um, but, you know, I'd, I'd want to be really imaginative with it and have some fun because that, that's how the kids of Winnie High are. And they love the, the members of the band that I'm close with. You know, they love 
uh, old movies and, and they love fantasy and, and they, they love a lot of them are really into, you know, uh, science fiction books and such. So, you know, let's let's get creative with it. it, it and, and that's something that I'm very excited about if we have the opportunity to do that in the future. I, I could see this being a hit with, with the with the kids. I honestly could. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I hope so. And really what we were trying to do, as you might have seen as well, because you, you're frankly not the only adult who's really enjoyed it. And as you said, Maya Bialik uh, gave us a great review. Uh, Jackson Brown, who right. actually helped the kids with their second album. And I'm sure a lot of your listeners, young or old alike, know who that is. You know, he's a legendary singer-songwriter. Sure. Song, right? And a few other people like that have really enjoyed it um, because – uh, I, you know, in the eighties and a little bit of the early nineties and, and certainly before that, um, I, you know, I was raised on all these different books and TV shows and movies that, uh, might've been more or less for kids, but still were what we call transgenerational, which means adults can enjoy it as well. And, you know, more modern versions of that might be some of the really good Pixar movies, for example, um, or certainly a lot of the great, you know, cartoon series of the eighties and nineties, that um you know we're, we're definitely aimed at kids but that adults can enjoy too or yeah again something like the muppets or a lot of what jim henson did or Wee's playhouse say um you know i did a, a book also uh about nickelodeon and certainly the first wave of shows there um you know were, were shows for kids but you know adults could enjoy the adventures of pete and pete or certainly ren and stimpy or um, some of the other shows that were on in those early years that, uh, you know, were as uh, they're the ones who taught me the word trans transgenerational. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I was hoping to bring to this kids of Whitney high book too. In fact, I I've always felt a little weird calling it a children's book or the technical term is middle grade reader, because I just, I just think it's a really fun story oh. and it happens to, you know, kind of be for kids, quote unquote. But I know a lot of adults who have really enjoyed it as well. Well, this is, and a, that's also a goal. This is the type of book an adult would take and read in the corner. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> yeah, I know because if another one comes out, I know I'm reading it. Well, you know, I, I, I've I've also always been really inspired ever since I was a kid. Um, you know, a few other examples of what I'm talking about here with the transgenerational theme. You know, Shel Silverstein is a great example. I mean, you know, you read some of the stuff now, and it really is hard to tell. Us, is this for children or is this for adults? Yep. And certainly, some of it is. Or Calvin and Hobbes, I think, is another but, really great yep. example. Um, you know, a lot of comic strips actually. I, I've just revi been revisiting the old Peanuts comic strips, and I mean the old ones from the the, the 1950s and 60s. Mm -hmm. And I'm shocked because so much of it is, you know, it's, it's pretty sophisticated. It's, it it is. really is for adults. You know, it's it's really not for kids at all, aside from it has sort of a kid like feel to it. So, um, I, and and certainly for the kids of Whitney High book, just other books. You know, Judy Bloom, Raul Dahl. Um, Phantom Tollbooth, uh, which I, I reread. Actually, I just reread again recently. I, you know, I love the Phantom Tollbooth. Um, and so, you know, when you read something even like Alice in Wonderland or Lord of the Flies, you know, is that right. for children or is that for adults? Animal Farm. I mean, a lot of people don't realize this. The original subtitle of Animal Farm was a fairy story. I mean, you know, George Orwell wanted to write a, basically a children's book about political issues. And the whole book is talking animals, for goodness sake. Exactly. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm obviously not uh, even remotely uh, comparing the quality of my book to something like that. But, you know, that that's where my head was at, was I was aspiring to create something that children would enjoy but that parents or babysitters or older brothers and sisters or aunts and uncles when reading it to their kids or reading it with their kids, or even if they wanted to kind of check it out because maybe the artwork intrigued them and they, they, they open a page, they could say, Hey, this is actually pretty good. You know, this is just good storytelling and character development. But that's so some, that's what I was working for. That's something else I wanted to say. You said you liked it. Add to your book. You want, you wanted to make more when you were saying about adding music. When you open this book, the artwork that's in this book and the pictures that are in this book, it is jam-packed. Yeah. It, it is. It's, a, it's, it's more than just a, a pages with words on it. There's pictures, there's diagrams, the music. It, it, there's yeah, a lot I, I, that goes know, into this book. I mean, the work that went into this book is unbelievable. Uh, well, that that's how I work. And, um, you know, I've, I've always felt like if I'm going to put my name on something 
And certainly I also felt a lot of responsibility on this project because it's not just my name. It's, it's the kids of Whitney high as a brand, as a band, uh, they have a lot of fans out there all over the world. I didn't want to upset them. I didn't want to misrepresent the kids in any way or, or, you know, put something out there that wasn't going to be of the highest quality possible. Uh, Michael Monaghan himself is a character in the book. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm dealing with essentially it's, it's, we make it very clear. It's a fictional version of the band, but um, you know, it's still basically their name. And so I did feel a lot of responsibility and Schiffer was great about that, too. They're a very, very small company um, and relatively new. They've been around for, I think, about 50 or 60 years. So they're not super new. Um, but, um, you know, they right away understood that we were doing something that was a little, that was kind of special here um, and that we all really needed to um, play our A game and and up our skills and, and really do the best. we can. Like I said, when, when I was thinking of doing the barcode idea with the music, I didn't even know if that was possible. Mm -hmm. um, and I kind of just brought it up like I assumed that it could be done. And, the, you know, and they, they said, yeah, let's do it. And they made it happen. Um, as with the artwork, I certainly have to, to call out the name of our fantastic genius uh, illustrator, Mikey Bracco. Definitely. He's also known as Spaghetti Kiss. Yeah, Mikey <laughs> Bracco, Spaghetti, Spaghetti Kiss. I, I have don't no know, idea where that name I don't know. From. I don't want to know how you came up with that name. <laughs> but he is so talented. And I've um, around the same time that I was developing this and coming out, I was actually working on my first comic book series, actual straight up comic book series with a company called Aftershock. So I was working with some artists there as well. Um, and, you know, I've, I've known a lot of artists in my life and I've worked with artists in other capacities before, um, including a few fairly big name people. Um, but, you know, I, so I, I'd like to think I have a good nose for talent and, and Mikey's work was just sensational. Um, oh. And, uh, you know, we worked out a really a nice deal. And, you know, it was like myself, I, I can tell you right now, when you're working on a children's book for a small company, based out of Pennsylvania, you know, no one's getting a lot of money out of it. Um, but Mikey was willing to work with us uh, for a very fair rate. And, um, you know, we worked out some deals for some, some back end royalty stuff and whatnot, some things that artists don't always get because we, you know, we wanted him on board. He wanted to be involved. Um, but, you know, we still need to make sure everyone's properly compensated because unfortunately we live in a world where you can't live off of good intentions. Right. Um, and, um, you know, and I, I've learned to just, you know, roll with those punches because, because, you know, it's not worth going into. And I've certainly talked about it in other shows and even in some of my books and articles and whatnot. But, you know, it's not an easy world being a, a working class creative as I am. And you don't do a book like the kids of Wendy Jr. High take over the world uh, to, you know, try to buy a house or to send your kids to college. It was basically a labor of love. I'm really glad that people are enjoying it. Um, as you said, we were a bestseller on Amazon for its uh, category for a while. And Sometimes, you know, it goes back and forth, as you know, those numbers change all the time, but that was exciting when that happened. And to get, you know, reviews from people like Mayim Bialik and Jackson Brown and a few of these others, um, you know, that, that's that's something that, you know, makes it worthwhile as well. Um, so, you know, it would be great if, if this can get bigger, not just for me and for the book, but I, I really think that the kids of Whitney High have a good 10 years left in them, at least. You know, they're all getting into their 40s uh, now as well, so they're not necessarily kids anymore. Um, but, you know, there's still, I think, a lot more music to be made. Um, their message about um, how even though they have various disabilities, uh, they can, you know, still do everything that anyone else can do and the normalcy of their lives when it comes to those kinds of things. And certainly right now, that's a very important message to remember. Um, and, you know, I do think that there's a lot of opportunities for TV shows, cartoons, movies, whatever else. I'm, I'm just very much hoping that we can use this to kind of wave a flag that, hey, the kids with the eye are still around and we would love to do more projects. And we're just waiting for, you know, some of those big name people who say yay or nay, give you the thumbs up or thumbs down to hopefully give us a few thumbs up so we can get some projects moving. And we're, we're talking with a few people right now and you never know what might happen, certainly with COVID and lockdown and everything else. It's, it's, a, it's a particularly difficult time to get anything going. Um, but those conversations are being had and the kids, you know, what's nice is the kids have their fans. They have some pretty big name fans, um, people who've worked with them and helped mm -hmm. them in the past who've really, you know, really, you know, helped out. And, and I want to say too, just because what she did was so 
supportive and really went beyond, um, you know, the, the typical just a post about her or something. But Maya Bialik uh, was was a savior in a lot of ways for this project. When you work with, again, a small company like Schiffer, their editorial staff was fantastic. Their design team was fantastic. Like I said, they put a barcode on the back with music that I didn't even know if that would be possible. Everything they did was great and really just very good people who really care about what they're doing. Uh, Pete Schiffer, the publisher himself, uh, you know, just a fantastic guy. We talk a lot all the time about other things as well. Um, but, you know, it's a small, limited company and they just don't have the kind of media connections that some of these larger entities have. So publicity was tough. It really was. Um, and particularly a book coming out during lockdown and COVID and we can't go to signings and we can't do, you know, all the big events we want to do. So for someone like Mayim Bialik, to, who has no connection to the band whatsoever, who just really liked the book, who really likes their music, who's worked with people with disabilities before in all different kinds of capacities, really cares about this community. Um, for her to not only post about it, but she made a video where she told people how much she enjoyed it. Oh, no, she, she's uh, she, a sweetheart. Yeah. No, she did She did a lot, and, and it really did make a difference. I mean, we... we, we we, I, you know, I hate talking about data and all that goodness, good stuff. But the reality is, we we saw the numbers jump dramatically. And if she hadn't helped us out like that, I don't, I don't know. We definitely would not have become a bestseller. Um, and you know, I mean, we we sold out the first run of the books within a couple of days, and that wow. was thanks to my. I mean, there's no question there. Wow. Uh, so so, and you know, uh, the, that's that's good. And that's the, the only thing that is a little negative about it. I have to say, as as grateful as we are to Mayim is. It is a little scary to think that that's what you need to do now to sell a book uh, like like this or really any book is it's not just even enough anymore to make a really great book to spend the two years on it that we did to as you said jam pack with great artwork and all these other special features and a good story and everything you know and we had a few little reviews and some things in some different magazines and whatnot but really what sold this thing was having a big name celebrity say hey everyone buy this book and, you know, again, grateful she did it and her heart was in the right place, but that we're in a society and a culture now where that's what you need to do to sell a book. That's something that I'm a little concerned about as a working class creative and as somebody who continues to work on projects like this and have friends who do projects like this who don't have the kind of money for, for, for publicity stuff. Because, you know, there's only so many times you're going to get a Maya Bialik to say yay or nay. And, you know, not everyone has a celebrity that they can talk to to help them out. And, and you know, I'm, I'm certainly not going to keep bugging her for other books or other Kids of Whitney High projects we're going to work on. Maybe she'll do it on her own. That would be fantastic. So I, I can't help but step outside of my own situation a little bit and say, that's great. She helped. But I'm uh, nervous and would hope that some things might change so that you don't need, you know, an influencer, as they call it, or a celebrity to help sell your books because, you should be able to sell books based on its quality product um, or, or, you know, some of these other things that aren't just, you know, who do you know type of stuff. So but you know hopefully that'll change, but we'll see. She might have started the spigot for you because, like, now I didn't know your name before we, before we started, and now I do. And when I see books written by you after reading this, I'm definitely going to take note and I'm going to look well, into it. I appreciate it. that. Because I that. Thank you. this written like that, like I'm looking at this and I'm thinking I have a younger nephew and I can sit down and read this book to him because there's lessons in this book. There's mm -hmm. lessons to take away from this book and me being an advocate for disabled people, you know, mm -hmm. this, this book stands for what I, what I tell at the end of my podcast, that things can always be worse no matter what. And there is really no such thing as a disabled person, only a person with a disability. And that's what exactly. these kids show. Yeah. They're not disabled people. They just have disabilities. Right. And these kids, that's what these kids show. And I think that's such a strong, such a strong message. And there's all kinds of messages in this one book alone. So like I said, I'm going to look now for your other books. <laughs> to be honest well, really with you, because that. I'm no, an avid reader. You. And, I appreciate that. You know, it, it's like I said. I I really I thoroughly enjoyed this book, and it, you can call it a children's book if you want. I don't care. And, <laughs> <laughs> I'm a big child. It's a novel. It's, it's a, a novel. novel. And yeah, it's yeah. a novel. I mean, yeah. I mean, like I said, I'm not I'm not kidding. I just I just recently reread Phantom Tollbooth, and that's definitely quote <clears> unquote <throat> for children. 
Um, but you know, I've, I've read it multiple times, even well through my adulthood or a book like Lord of the Flies or Animal Farm. Sure. So, or even, you know, look, I, I actually did a, a whole podcast episode on someone else's show, um, a few weeks ago, uh, where they actually have different authors talk about different children's books and we analyze it, talk about it. And I was talking about the butter battle book by Dr. Seuss. And I mean, okay. there's another really great example of, uh, you know, even something like cat in the hat or, Oh, the places you'd go, you'll go books like this. I mean, you know, there, or the Lorax, um, you know, they're technically for children, but Hey, come on. And there's obviously other things going on there. And I, you know, those are the really great books or movies or TV series or, or just art in general that, you can enjoy for one reason when you're younger, it's bright pictures, it's funny, it's goofy words, uh, you know, maybe bodily functions, you know, <laughs> silly things are happening. It's cartoonish. But then when you get older and you look back on it and you say, hey, I want to read that again. And you go, Oh my goodness, there's, there's some interesting messaging going on. Exactly. There's, there's, you know, they were, or even just down to even beyond that. I mean, one of the reasons I enjoy, reading Raul Dahl and Raul Dahl's another person who I've read over and over again. I mean, I just also reread Matilda recently too. And yeah, you can read it in a day or two. I mean, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's not a hard read, but one of the reasons I enjoy reading Matilda or some of the other Raul Dahl books is it's not so much about messaging. It's just about that is really good writing. That is, that's really fantastic exactly. storytelling. It is fantastic character development. Uh, it, you know, when it's funny, it, it's really funny. It's imaginative. There are things that maybe I forgot that I remember again when I read. Uh, Lewis Sacker, I have to say, S-A-C-H-A-R, is another one who I read over and over and over again. He he wrote the book that Holes was based on. He wrote uh, the series uh, Way, uh, Sideways Stories from Wayside School. Um, actually just came out with his, his first new one in about 25 years um, a few months ago. And that one, and even that one was great. And uh, so, you know, these these are people who are writing this really great material or like I said, even TV shows or movies. I mean, I can watch Labyrinth or The Dark Crystal or Never Ending Story um, mm -hmm. or some of these other movies that are kind of for, you know aimed at kids. But you can watch them as adults and sure. say, A, there's some interesting messaging going on there. But B, more importantly, I mean, when I watch Labyrinth, I mean, it as as a professional writer. Um, you know, I have to say there's some very smart storytelling and some really smart, uh, you know, character development there. It's a very, it's very well-written script and it teaches me and reminds me of certain elements of just storytelling in general. Um, and I really appreciate that too. So, so the aesthetic value of something like that, I think is really important. And, um, you know, I don't want to be too much of a curmudgeon. It's easy <laughs> to say it, but I do feel that there's a there's quite a paucity of that right now in film and television and books for kids. That you know, I've I've tried finding other uh, things out there like that, um, and you know, I I tend to just keep going back to Roald Dahl and Judy Bloom and and Louis Sacco. Well, like I said, it's like you know, do I want to read a new children's book or do I want to read Phantom Tollbooth? I'd rather read Phantom Tollbooth. Well, now, and so now yeah. you're showing your age. <laughs> <laughs> they don't make them like they used to. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, what can I say? You know what? The only reason I, I feel a little bit all right about saying that is I, is I think more and more people are saying the same thing. And even, I, you know, some people who are younger, uh, I've worked with kids in different writing programs and things like that. And, um, you know, I'm surprised sometimes, or I've actually stopped being, you know, I'll meet kids who, yeah, they, they know some of these TV shows. I mean, my, my, I have a friend, uh, he and his wife, they have a daughter, Alice. Um, that I've known her entire life. She calls me Uncle Matt. And, you know, she knows almost every line to the Who documentary, The Kids Are All Right. Uh -huh. And, I mean, you know, she's seven or eight years old. And it's like, <laughs> you know, when, you, when you're that age and you know who Pete Townsend is and you can point to the screen. Exactly. And she's, you know, it's like, so I, I think that there, and, I, and I've met other kids and things who surprised me. Uh, you know, also I have to say, having written the book about Nickelodeon, Slimed, I get emails sometimes from, you know, much younger people, 13, 14 years old, who will tell me, hey, you know, I never knew about Ren and Stimpy or I never knew about some of these other shows uh, until I read your book. Thank you for telling me about it. And they'll, you know, it's their words, not mine. They'll say, you know, there's nothing like this out there now, yeah. you know, and so. Um, and I think that's why, you know, you and I, Jimmy, were talking before we started the show about all these reboots. And there are a lot of reasons for that. But I think one of them is because 
um, you know, there was some really great stuff back then. And unfortunately, when they reboot them, they, they tend it, to not be so great. Right, exactly. But, you know, I think there's a reason why we keep going back to these old movies and TV shows and books, because there was some really great stuff. Um, and, you know, hopefully we'll see another renaissance of that kind of stuff, especially for children. Because, uh, you know, I've, tr I've tr really tried and I, I just there's not a lot out there that I can see right now. But, you know, who knows? Who knows what the future will bring? Really? So, well, yep. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for being here today. And thank you. I definitely want to thank you for the kids from Whitney Junior High. I really do thank want you. to thank you for that because, like I said, I enjoy it. But, well, thank you. And I, I do want to make it clear just because I know it can be a little confusing. Um, the the book is the kids of Whitney Junior High take over the world, as you said, Jimmy. And then the actual band is the kids of Whitney High. So people are looking for kids of Whitney High videos or music or any or their website, kids of Whitney High dot com. Um, it'll be under kids of Whitney High. That's W-I-D-N-E-Y. Um, I'm sure you'll have some links and such uh, where we upload this, Jimmy. But um, yeah, and, and I would very much I, I appreciate everything you said about you know, looking for some of my other books and things like that. I certainly have a lot out there and thank you for that, Jimmy. But, um, you know, this, uh, like I said, this, this was definitely a labor of love and as uh, has all my work been with the kids of Whitney high, I just think that they're great people. I think they're very funny. I think they're very talented. Um, and I've, I have a certain, uh, platform that I've, I've evolved and grown over the last 20 years of my career. Um, and when I'm able to, you know, give whatever spotlight I can, to a band in a group like the kids of Whitney high, I'm happy to do it. So, um, you know, the best way that anybody could, um, you know, kind of, uh, show me some love here would be to show some to the kids of Whitney high. And like I said, they have four albums out. Um, they're all really great music and, uh, they, uh, were in a movie called the ringer with Johnny Knoxville and Catherine Hagel a few years ago, not the best movie, but it's great to see the kids in it. And we, there's all different kinds of music videos and things out there. And, uh, they have merch and such. So, um, uh, you know, especially right now, uh, money's really tight for everybody. They all, they all come from very disadvantaged backgrounds too. So money's very, very tight for all of them as well. And certainly none of this is going to, you know, be a big boon for them, but if, for people to be able to support the band would be great. Um, and I also just have to make one other shout out here. Uh, as you know, um, from, from having read the book, we also have partnered with a group called LA goal, which for more than 50 years now has provided recreational, vocational and educational services to people with disabilities throughout the greater LA area. Um, and they get a portion of the profits from book sales as well. So, um, and, you know, definitely look into LA goal right now. That's LA gold.org. They've been hit really hard by COVID and, and lockdown stuff. And, you know, their, their budgets have been a little bit wonky lately. So, um, you know, even if you're not interested in buying kids money high book or something like that, if anybody's listening to this and, you know, is looking for uh, donation, you know, to give donations or to support organizations like this, please look into LA goal. They definitely can use in their great, great organization that deserve, you know, as much support as possible. If people are, are looking to get into humanitarian things or even just to volunteer if you're in the area or things like that. So, well, I, I'll, I want to throw that out there too. <laughs> I'll add those links into the show notes below, below Thank the you. podcast. Definitely great, without great. a doubt. And I'll add your contact information so that they can contact you directly or your... Um, if, if you could for that, yeah, just if you can keep it to the website. That's what I, I meant. appreciate that. To your yeah, website. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Yeah. I'll give them your email right, address and your phone right number. Right <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey, you never know these days. <laughs> yeah. No, no, I meant your, I meant yeah. your, I yeah. meant your okay, website. No, I appreciate that. No, thank you. And yeah, uh, so, um, this yeah, way, so. th they'll be able to check out, check you out and check out LA Goal. And I def I'll put a link up to where they can purchase your book. Great. And we got it all covered. Thank so, you very much. I know I should probably tell everyone to buy the book on Amazon because we all have to play the Amazon video game right now of, of getting as many reviews and such on your book as possible for all the algorithm fun. But, you know, I can't help myself, even though it's shooting myself in the foot. I love local bookstores. I love local businesses in general. They all really need our help right now. So I'm going to just say it, as I've said a few other times, um, you know, if you can get the book, if you can order it or get it from your local bookstore, if they're open and if it's, it's safe for you to do that, 
uh, please do that because you know we we need local bookstores, we need local businesses. Um, I'm not going to say too much negative things about Amazon. Certainly, nothing that's not already been said. But um, you know, it would be a real shame if uh, in the next year, as things start opening back up, all we have are you know Amazon stores and Starbucks and things. So let's let's try to keep our our local bookstores going strong. They need our help. And uh, so if you can purchase, if anyone's listening to this and, and wants to purchase the book, um, you know, Amazon definitely helps me. Um, but I want to help local businesses and local bookstores because I just I'm the kind of I was the kind of kid who liked hanging out at bookstores and at um, libraries and museums. And, uh, you know, we need to all work together to keep those going. And this is one way of doing it is if you can buy your books from local bookstores as opposed from Amazon. So uh, just going to throw that out there. Whoever's gotten this long in the, in the episode, I, I really I try to push that as much as possible. So, yep. There you go. <laughs> All right, Matthew, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. And we'll talk to you soon. Okay. All right, great. Thanks again, Matthew. Boy, I'll tell you what. He is such an easy person to talk to. And if you want to learn more about him, you can go to his website, www.matthewclickstein.com. That's www.matthewclickstein.com. That's M-A-T-H-E-W, Clickstein, that's K-L-I-C-K-S-T-E-I-N dot com. He's amazing. He's a very, very, very nice man, easy man to talk to, and a wealth of information. Take a look at his website. Very interesting. Okay, let's move on here. I want to thank you for stopping by again this week. And I want to remind you, things can always be worse. No matter what, there's somebody right now wishing that they were in your position. So things can always be worse. Remember that, my friends. You've been listening to An Apple A Day. My name is Jimmy Apple, and I'll talk to you again real soon. Have a great one. Thanks for listening to An Apple A Day with Jimmy Apple your gateway to a happy, healthy life. Join our community at www.famousapple.com. See you next time.